tell me about potential projects or presentations, I mean. When I say project, presentation. Um, yeah. Well, as, if it's not well known to you necessarily, it's, I mean, you, you would, the purpose is for you to present something that you're interested in. Fiberglass is fine. It's a little broad to just say pi fiberglass everywhere because it's been around for so long. You might pick an application and say, okay, people use fiberglass in small craft boat, ho boat holes. Why? Why don't they make them out of wood? because they do make some of them out of wood. Why don't they make them out of another type of plastic? Well, hopefully you may have learned some things about properties of plastics, why you want to use a composite in that application. But composites are more expensive than steel or aluminum. People make boats out of aluminum, but um, and why wouldn't you make it out of steel? People make boats out of steel. So there's lots of materials and you could say, okay, here's an application. Someone has chosen fiberglass, why? in that application okay so but I'd, you'd take small boats or take tennis rackets or get it focus it a little bit more or you're just going to be well fiberglass is a material composed of fiber in a, in a plastic resin well okay <laughs> you know, I want a little more depth than that I want a little more thought into well why did you you know in the case like that why would someone choose fiberglass in this application in fact depending I should finish up this week. We've got a guest lecturer, Adam Powell, on Thursday, who's going to talk about um, Infinium, uh, which is a new process that started out here at MIT, and then the professor got went over to Boston University, and now they started this company that's going through about 10 or 20 million dollars of of uh, funding for a new environmentally clean way to make all kinds of metals, almost everything on the periodic table, um, and. Um, Anyway, so Adam will be giving a guest lecture. But on Friday, I've been, if, we, if I have time, I've been thinking about doing something like comparing soda bottles or you know, beverage containers. What are the materials of choice? In, are we on the thing? Yeah, okay, that's fine. So what are the materials of choice in beverage containers? I mean, you know. There is aluminum, plastic, paper or actually most paper is a composite even if it is just the uh, plastic coated paper of milk cartons but if you go to those drink boxes that's seven layer composite okay so it's pretty complex but anyway what did you say glass okay that's right so why would someone ch there's also one other steel uh, it turns out in Japan, anybody ever lived in Japan for a little while, visited Japan? Yes. And you go and you use the vending machine and you get a soda. Is that an aluminum can? Depends. Nowadays it depends. When I lived there 30 years ago, it was always steel. And it was a political thing. Japan doesn't have an indigenous aluminum industry, but their government wanted to protect their steel industry and give them a bigger market. So the Japanese used steel, not because it was cheaper, not because it was better, but because the government was trying to protect their steel or give a market to the steel companies. Okay, but anyway, so I might go through something like that. Um, uh, not that the steel companies really needed it in 1985, but they still had it. But I, in talking to people, I haven't been back to Japan for 10 years now. But I do understand that yes, they are using more aluminum cans, and that's because they don't need to protect their steel industry anymore. Okay. Um, and it gets down to economics, okay? So steel is sort of going away. But there was this one thing where, gee, they use steel in Japan. Why do they do that? But anyway, uh, what do they make cars out of in Europe? Steel or aluminum in general? Steel. But at the price of fuel in Europe, aluminum should be cheaper. So why do they make steel cars? because everybody wants to sell into the United States, okay? And at the price of fuel in the United States, steel is cheaper, okay? But actually in Europe, 
the Europeans, if they were only selling in their own market, all their automobiles would be aluminum, okay? But they couldn't sell in the United States then. They'd be pricing out of the market. But anyway, okay. Um, anybody have any questions? I was kind of asking questions about the presentations if people have ideas and stuff. Probably one day this week I may ask you to start writing down what your topics are and stuff or letting me know. So think about it. Uh, remember, you've only got about 10 minutes for the presentation. That means 10 overheads max. Um, and you probably ought to practice your presentation in front of a mirror or something to make sure you can do it in 10 minutes. If you can do it in 10 minutes with no audience, you will probably do it in 12 minutes without, with an audience, okay? Just making eye contact or someone raises a question in the middle of it for something, okay? Um, I remember as a young assistant professor giving my first few talks at some conference, I would go over that talk 15 times and literally stand in the hotel room in front of the mirror and give the talk over and over. Now, I don't have to do that anymore, but uh, maybe I should. But um, nonetheless, if you, if you haven't had a lot of experience giving presentations, you need to practice. You don't just kind of waltz in and do it, okay? Um, any questions, concerns? The, um, we started talking about steels last time, and hopefully we're going to finish up here in just a minute. I mentioned that they're made everywhere. It's the most, one of the most technologically advanced materials, if not the most technologically advanced. We know more about it than anything else just because of the size of the market. There are many types of steels, and I gave a handout. If you didn't get it last time, you can see Jerry because I gave her all the leftover handouts. Um, but this was one of the handouts, and it talks about, oh, that's various hardnesses of steels, but it talks about, oops, plain carbon steel parts uh, and all the different types of steels. One of you asked, well, why are there so many steels? And I pointed out last time that the carbon content of the steel determines its strength to a first approximation, and we go from a uh, this 1050 would be a, uh, a half percent carbon steel, and then it'll have a 1010 on here. Here's 1010 uh, for a carburized part. That's got a tenth of a percent. The, the, the last two digits are hundredths of a percent of carbon. And typically, most carbon steels are less than 1% um, uh, carbon. So here's a stabilizer bar, which is a 1090 steel, okay? Lawnmower blade, 1060. Uh, a spring, or yeah, spring at 1080, okay? High strength, high carbon, low strength, low carbon. But then we also have alloy steel parts that have typically different amounts of chrome, nickel, molybdenum, and vanadium. And there's a whole wide range of these. And I pointed out the difference, there's a difference between uh, hardness, hardenability, and hardening ability. I don't know if I have that. Yeah, I've got it right here. Um, I g actually gave you a part of a dictionary of materials where hardness is just the resistance to indentation. It's a direct measure of the strength. In fact, the hardness measurement, if you measure it in kilograms per square millimeter or KSI, is about three times the, the tensile strength of the, of the material, whether it's steel or copper or aluminum. Uh, the hardness is about three times the tensile strength for a ductile material. Then there's hardenability, which is how deep can you harden this? And I just mentioned this thing where I was asked by a professor over, and it would be now mechanical engineering, but at the time he was in naval architecture. He's working on the America's Cup, and he had a four inch thick, what do you call that? It's not a keel. The, it's a, it, okay, maybe it's a, it's a keel beam, but it's on a big sailboat like that. The keel beam is not just on a big ship. The keel is, you know, the thing you build everything up from. In fact, there's a keel beam on a, on a 747, for example. It's a big aluminum beam, and they build everything up from that. But in a, in a sailboat, 
or this, this, that particular America's Cup, they had a, a big steel thing that cr created the resistance to being blown sideways, okay? And this was supposed to be four inch thick HY-130. Well, HY-130 was a very weldable steel, or is, well, it's a more weldable than most steels. Still got its problems. But the Navy had developed it in the 1950s and 60s for submarine hulls, and it needed to be wel weldable, and so it's got less than, it's got about 0.2% carbon. Well, it turns out this was four inches thick. It had to have enough hardenability to be able to transform to martensite four inches deep. So you get uniform th strength through the thickness. Whereas carbon steel, oh, you might be able to get, depending on the carbon steel, a good eighth of an inch or quarter of an inch thick before you lose your ability to quench it fast enough but when you start putting these alloying elements in there, it slows down the transformation and you can heat something and quench it such that you get hardness four inches, eight inches, even deeper than that in some steels, okay? Not that we need that in most things, but for this keel beam, they, this was supposed to be, as I remember, about four inches thick. And they actually were bending it in the, some of the trials. It was plastically deforming. Uh, it's better than snapping, but anyway. Uh, they also want weight down in the bottom of the ship, okay? Uh, they want lightweight, but they also want weight in the bottom. If you're going to have weight, you want it in the bottom. In fact, they used to put lead in these ships in the bottom. Which you're paying a huge penalty, but they just needed the weight towards the bottom. In any case, hardenability is the depth and distribution of hardness that can be induced by quenching. Hardening ability is what the maximum hardness can be and it turns out, depending on your carbon content, at about 0.6 carbon, you get to the maximum hardness that you're going to get in most steels. Well, it turns out HY-130 only had about 0.2% carbon, and it only had 130 KSI yield. If you went to 4340, which is readily available in big, heavy sections, we use it to make all kinds of pressure vessels, not pressure vessels necessarily, but components, high-strength components, in thicknesses up to 10 inches thick, but it's got 0.4 carbon, 4340, okay, the 40 is 0.4% carbon, and you can get much higher hardness, uh, much higher strength, 180 KSI rather than 130. So they wanted to use 4340, but they didn't know how to weld it in that thickness, okay? So that's why he called me up one morning. Um, and I showed him how to weld 4340. It's not easy, not cheap, but who cares if you're building an America's Cup? It's only it's only ten of a kind. You may only be sailing one ship, but they actually they actually have multiple hulls, okay, on these things. It's a very interesting business. Um, we're not doing it right now, but yeah. Can I weld really well? Not particularly. I don't do it every day. I can weld. I was taught when I was an engineer at Bethlehem Steel by the technicians. I said I want to learn how to weld. You know. And they took me out, and I did a lousy job. Uh, I always remember one, one time, though, I was walking through my lab, not like it looks like now, but they used to have a bunch of oxyacetylene setups, and just like they have the, um, the blacksmith shop in the basement, they used to have a guy. Um, it started when I was a student. Um, not that I had anything to do with it, but my thesis advisor became the head of this little thing. But it was to help a technician who's... The guy who had the welding lab before me left in 1968 when I came as a freshman. And he had a technician, Tony Zona. And Tony didn't want to go to Wisconsin with Professor Adams, so he, he just stayed at MIT, but he didn't have really have th anything to do. So he started teaching an art sculpture class, okay? And they would do oxyacetylene welding. So I was walking through my lab just 20 years later, and I had four or five of my students all standing around one of these tables with the oxyacetylene torch, I said, oh, what are you doing? And they were trying to teach themselves to oxyacetylene weld. I said, they look like terrible. They look like turds on a plate, okay? And I said, that's not how you do it. And I said, give me that. So I, I took the torch and I put down an oxyacetylene bead. And it was a very nice looking weld bead. And I, walk, I told them how to do it and stuff. And I walked away. What they didn't know is that was the first time in my life I had ever oxyacetylene welded. Okay, but I did understand heat flow and welding. 
and I understood the thermal time constant for oxyacetylene welding as opposed to arc welding. If you take my welding thing, I might even tell this same story. And so I knew you had to go slow, and I actually knew how slow you had to go. And if you realize that, most people try to rush it, okay? But anyway, that's another story. Turns out, um, I also do a thing about reaction times. Uh, a lot of schools, if you go to Wentworth Technology, they will probably teach you welding by starting you with oxyacetylene. And the reason is the thermal time constant is on the order of three to five seconds of that weld pool. So you've got to go really slow, okay? Three to five seconds in one spot. But if you do that, you get a good weld. For an arc weld, the thermal time constant is on the order of a tenth to three tenths of a second. It's ten times faster because the heat intensity is ten times greater. This all makes sense if you actually take the heat transfer part of my course. Um, and uh, I pointed out that that was because the reaction time. When someone's starting, you don't start out on the highest speed of a video game, right? You have to build up your skill and your reaction reflexes to various things, and a welder has to do the same thing. There are many places where they start people out and they give them one week worth of instruction in welding and they start them out with arc welds and they make terrible welds for several days and then um, they send them out there to make terrible welds in production. Um, but if you go through a, a, a four month class, they will start you out with oxyacetylene for several weeks and then move you on to arc welding. So it's like learning how to play because it's hand-eye hand coordination, let's face it, if you're manually welding. So, yes, I do know how to weld. Am I the best welder in the world? No, okay? If I welded a pressure vessel, not only would it not pass the inspection, most likely, <clears throat> but um, I wouldn't want to stand next to it when it's pressurized, if it ever did get pressurized. Um, but it's partly because you really need to do it on a regular basis. A typical... Um, welder, I think the codes require, it depends on which code it is, require that if you have not welded in the past year, you must be requalified because you haven't kept up your skills. Okay? So there's skill, but I don't practice sufficiently. All the rest of you could weld if you wanted to learn. Many students come to me and say, oh, I'd like to learn to weld. So I send them off with one of the technicians. And usually after about one or two hours of making lousy welds, they say, okay. <laughs> Very few students over the years have ever gone for more than uh, a few hours worth of practice. But getting back to steels, there's hardness, there's hardenability, and there's hardening ability. Hardness is merely how strong it is. Hardenability is how deep can you get a hardness, and hardening ability is how, what's the maximum strength you can get under the best conditions, okay? Um, and because of that, I pointed out, we have many, many steels because they're used in such high volume that people will literally demand, I want a tenth of a percent nickel more or a tenth of a percent nickel less in the steel. And that might not sound like much, but a tenth of a percent nickel is 10, 10 pounds in the, or 20 pounds in a ton. And at $10 a pound, that's $200 a ton. So it makes a difference, particularly if you're buying 100,000 tons. You would be talking $20 million. So there are many, many steels that, uh, does that answer the question? I think it was your question several weeks ago. I said I would cover why we have so many steels. I also talked about um, <coughs> the Achilles heel of steel being corrosion, and we'll get, get to that um, more. But I think the easiest way is to actually jump into stainless steels as the next class of material, <coughs> separate of the <coughs> carbon and low alloy steels. The stainless steels, and this comes out of a book by John Sedricks called Corrosion of Stainless Steels, and he has the genealogy of stainless steels. The first stainless steel was basically what we call 304 stainless steel. It was discovered like 1907 or so, I think in Sweden. Um, they were, back then, they were just learning how to make steels of different compositions, and they were adding different things. 
Uh, you may have heard of 188 uh, stainless steel. Basically, instead of 19 chrome, 10 nickel, 18 chrome, 8 nickel, it's all within the range of this 304 stainless. Uh, it's either 40% or 60% of all stainless steel is 304 stainless steel. I think it's 40% of all stainless steel and 60% of all the austenetics. I actually ought to probably tell you about the different types of stainless steel. There is austenitic, ferritic, martensitic, um, duplex, and precipitation hardening. And this actually goes through all of those. So the austenitics have face center cubic crystal structure. They're non-magnetic. Um, and it, like I say, 304 is the most common of all the stainless steels. Uh, but it, You'd like to improve on that, uh, that alloy that's been around for 100 years. And so one of the things they do is they might add sulfur or selenium for machinability. We actually also add sulfur um, to plain old carbon steels for machinability. You end up with sulfur inclusions, and when the chips are coming off the lathe or the milling machine, the, those inclusions, which will tend to form stringers, will cause the chips to break up, and you don't get this long, Pig t corks, uh, corkscrew pigtail that'll whip around and get get in things and cut people's arms off and things like that. Yeah. For sulfur control, that's in steel in general. Okay. Um, steel cannot be made without manganese, um, although we do make some now that have extremely low manganese. But to give you the history on that. Um, but when you finish answering your question, if, if you had a question about why is manganese in steel, it's not stainless steels per se, it's actually steels have to have manganese for sulfur control. But was that your question? Yeah. Okay. I'm looking for, here it is. Well, that's not the one I wanted, but anyway, I can use this. It's all marked up, but um, I should have another one in here somewhere. It's not all marked up. Um, in any case, the um, in uh, the you, to make steel in the old days, actually even today, you take iron ore, coal, and limestone, and you put them in a blast furnace. And you make cast iron. Okay. The problem is the coal may have two or three percent sulfur in it, and if it does, the sulfur ends up getting in the steel. Well, iron sulfide is a very low melting alloy, and if you take that steel without any manganese around, and you try to roll that steel, when you heat it up to the hot working temperature of 1800 to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, and you try to roll it, it will just shatter because it has liquid grain boundaries of iron sulfide along the grain boundaries. And so that's not good. Uh, but that's what happened in the 1880s, and they didn't understand that it was sulfur until they were using different ores in different parts of the world. And some people had this problem, some people didn't. They started analyzing it, and they found manganese, the steels with three-tenths of a percent or um, more manganese, would not shatter. And then people started analyzing it. They had learned about metallography in the 1880s. They started doing metallography to look at where the sulfur was. And they found you found you formed manganese sulfides. If you look at the periodic table, all the elements in the periodic table, the only element, the only two elements that have higher melting sulf sulfides than iron are manganese and molybdenum. And it turns out when you add molybdenum to iron, it turns out you get a low melting sulfide. When you add manganese to iron, you get a high melting sulfide that melts above the melting temperature of the iron. The only element in the periodic table that does that. There is no other element that will tie up the sulfur impurity. So you have to 
either get rid of your sulfur impurity or you have to put manganese in the steel. And so I guess um, quite one of the questions is, why do steels contain manganese? Well, they contain manganese because if you, here's the clean periodic table. Anyway, if you didn't have manganese, the steel would not be hot workable. It would just, it's like if you were trying to hot work a Slurpee, which is a liquid on top of a solid ice particles, okay? The steel would have that kind of consistency when you compress it, it would actually crack apart, okay? So it's not exactly like a Slurpee, it's not the best analogy, but it's, you basically have liquids along the rain boundaries. So um, a steel officially is an iron carbon alloy, but it always has some manganese, usually about three tenths of a percent, up to two percent. And it has some silicon quite often, doesn't have to. The silicon is there to get some of the oxygen out. Uh, manganese will take some of the oxygen out. I don't want to get into talking too much about steel because I always talk, already talk too much about steel. But there is some basic metallurgy in the manganese. Historically, they would say the manganese had to be eight to 10 times the sulfur content because you have to tie up the sulfur. Nowadays, we've learned to get the sulfur out of the steel while we make the steel using the right types of fluxes. And one of the guys who taught the world how to do this using the principles of physical chemistry was John Chipman of the Chipman Room. I mentioned the other day that the world learned how to make steel from John Chipman. Well, he was the one, he and Nick Grant, who was a professor starting here in 1946, the two of them basically published some of the first articles on control of sulfur and steel in the 1930s. People knew you put manganese in, but they didn't know how much manganese, and they were wasting a lot of money on manganese. Virtually all the manganese in the world goes into alloying for steel. Um, uh, then they also, next thing they did is they taught people how to get rid of the phosphorus in steel, or how to control the phosphorus. A lot of the iron ores in Europe are high in phosphorus. And phosphorus can be good in steel in small quantities, but it's bad in large quantities. So anyway, there's a lot about the alloying elements of steel. People teach whole courses at some universities on this. Not much anymore, but there's still a few universities. In any case, you start with 304 and you can add sulfur and in stainless steels you add selenium because you can afford it. You can't afford it in most carbon steels. They have some carbon steels with selenium, but only if you can't have sulfur for some other reason. Selenium, if you look at the periodic table, is beneath sulfur, isn't it? Yeah. So all you've done is go down the periodic table and you get these inclusions in the steels that help break up the chips. When we machine brass, we used to put lead in a lot because it would break up the chips. Free machining brass is a leaded brass. And it forms lead inclusions rather than sulfur inclusions uh, in steel. But anyway, so that's 304 stainless. What do we lose when we do that? It's not weldable anymore. You can't weld the 304, 303 stainless. But it's the same composition, just has a high sulfur. I meant to bring in, I have a, actually it's a carbon steel uh, hinge from a sub-zero freezer. Anybody know what a sub-zero refrigerator is? Yeah. Uh, well, actually it can, I guess. It's an $11,000 home refrigerator, okay? Very high end. Obviously none of you have millionaires for parents or multi-millionaires for parents. Um, I have a son who just bought a house and it has a sub-zero uh, refrigerator and a wolf stove. Wolf stove goes for only five or six thousand. Um, very high-end uh, kitchen appliances. But I have a sub-zero hinge because someone made a mistake. They had this little pin that was supposed to be made out of carbon steel and welded to a carbon steel plate to make the hinge and someone made a mistake, they used 303 when they were machining these little pins that had to be welded and when they went to weld them, they had cracks. They didn't see the cracks, they, they plated them, put them on the refrigerators and people bought $11,000 refrigerators and the doors started falling off. They were not happy, okay? And these are the type of people who have enough money to sue you, okay? So if you're gonna if you're gonna shaft somebody, do it to poor people. They can't afford attorneys. Um, but in any case, uh, that actually costs about seven million dollars worth of repairs. 
duplex stainless steels, they increase the chromium and lower the nickel to get higher strength. You can double or triple the strength by going to a duplex stainless. A duplex stainless is merely a mixture of about, let's call it 50-50 or 30-70 or 70-30, of austenite and ferrite, ferrite being a body centered cubic magnetic phase. So I probably don't have a magnet with me, but this is a piece of duplex stainless steel. It came off a, a, a centrifuge that was used to separate starch from other things. Um, when they started, well, one of the, they started selling a lot of these centrifuges when they started making methanol from corn, okay? Because they had to separate the starch from all the other liquid and the corn and stuff. Uh, so they used a big centrifuge, and this thing weighs about a ton, and it spins around at like 3,000 RPM, and it's about four feet in diameter. It's made out of cast duplex stainless steel because they needed high strength. Turns out, if you're not careful in the duplex stainless steels, you have higher chromium and lower nickel, and you have the ferrite, which can get hydrogen in it. But the real problem is you can get iron chrome intermetallic phases, which embrittle it. You want to see a brittle steel. Here it is. Did have a little bit of ductility. If you look on this edge right here, you'll see a little. If you hold it up, you can see the curvature of the centrifuge. But right on this edge, you can actually see um, a slight change in the curvature. And if you look carefully, you actually see the grains where the large grains of this casting started to stretch, what we call orange peel, okay? Because it looks like the surface of an orange, sort of, in some cases. Um, it can be extremely brittle if you don't do it properly, but you can get 100 KSI strength rather than 30 or 40 KSI strength for the 304. So you can triple the strength. What do we use it for? Uh, they use it now, it's become very popular in the last 15 or 20 years for downhole sour gas applications where you need high strength, deep wells in the oil business. Before that, it was very specialized. They used it on the catapults of Navy aircraft carriers, okay? Need a high strength corrosion resistant alloy. It has, it has better chloride stress corrosion resistance than 304. And so if you had a chloride environment uh, and you wanted high strength, you could go to duplex stainless. Hard to weld, but high strength and uh, some interesting mechanical properties, but you pay a price in, in some other things. It can be toughness prices and it can be a welding price. Precipitation hardening stainlesses have been around for a long time. I thought I had it. Yeah, I do have it with me. Um, so here's a $300 pair of scissors, actually probably 600 now. These are medical grade scissors. They actually have a nickel base uh, hard alloy insert brazed in them. Um, but because they are medical, instead of being a $40 pair of scissors, they are a, well, 25 years ago when I got them, they were a $300 pair. I bet they're 600 now, okay? Precipitation hardened and stainless, okay? You wouldn't do that for a regular pair of scissors. What do you care about it on the handle? But, you know, the doctors want to know if they're paying $600 for a pair of scissors, they're getting the best quality. Why is precipitation hardened? If you're going to put inserts in the cutting edge, I don't know why you need to precipitation harden it. But anyway, the Navy used to use these on hydrofoils, okay, for the ships. Need corrosion resistance. Aluminum would just erode away. They make the base ship out of out of uh, aluminum for lightweight, but the foils that are going through the water, I have no idea on the America's Cup because those are hydrofoils now, basically. I have no idea what they use, but they might be using a precipitation hardness stainless. You can get 180 KSI out of these steels, okay? Uh, you have to go through a, a fancy heat treatment harder than regular carbon steels or alloy steels, but you can get tremendous strength. Um, 201 and 202 add manganese and nitrogen for and lower the nickel to get higher strength. So you can get uh, 80 or to 100 KSI and it's cheaper. Manganese instead of chrome, okay? Manganese is a lot cheaper than chrome. Um, I don't actually see these that often, but in certain applications. If you go to really high manganese, like 12, 13 percent, you get what they call Hadfield's manganese steel, which is not officially a stainless steel, but it is an alloy that work hardens so rapidly 
that you literally cannot cut it with a saw. Not that it's not easily formable in its annealed condition, but you go to saw it, and as you're cutting those chips, it hardens and about triples its strength. It will dull saw blades. One of the uses of Hadfield's manganese steel was prison bars. Okay? You got a file? Yeah, you want to dull your file? <laughs> okay? Try to file through a Hadfield's manganese steel. Because it transforms as you're work hardening it to this hard martensitic steel. Uh, in fact, the martensitic steels, you take the nickel out, lower the chrome down to around uh, 10 or 12 percent, and you get the 403, 410, and 420 steels. Many of the uh, uh, scissors and uh, medical instruments are actually made out of the martensitics. Yeah. Yeah, they're magnetic. Martensite is basically the same as ferrite, except you've trapped carbon in the lattice and it becomes body centered tetragonal, but very barely body centered tetragonal. Rather than body centered cubic, this is face centered cubic. This is body centered cubic. This is body centered tetragonal. Duplex is FCC plus BCC. That's why you call it duplex. And precipitation hardening is basically FCC with precipitates which do the hardening, okay? If you want to talk general strength levels, you might be talking, uh, let's say 40 KSI. Ferritics might be 40 to 80, depending on how work hardened they are. Um, these actually could be heading up towards 160. If you take piano wire, you take this and you deform it and deform it and deform it into wire, you can get up to, actually you can get up to 300 KSI, but body centered tetragonal, you can be up to 180 KSI, but you really like to be less than 120 for hydrogen embrittlement reasons. Duplex, typically about 100 KSI, good ductility, good chloride resistance, and precipitation hardening, 180 KSI with good ductility and reasonable hydrogen embrittlement resistance. Um, pardon me? The only ones that are hydrogen and brittle are the ones that are BCC. That's the... Uh, uh, mm, frankly, it's still a matter of opinion among metallurgists. What causes hydrogen embrittlement? There's four or five theories out there. Strain in the lattice. Um, I suspect when we get really good at, uh, um, oops, what is going on here? Oh, that's my, okay. Um, when we get really good at, at uh, quantum mechanics um, on a larger crystal, okay, rather than just a few atoms, we might be able to figure out what hydrogen does in terms of embrittling the f body center cubic structure. You can embrittle the austenitic um, structure, the FCC structure, but it takes 50 to 100 times as much hydrogen to do it. So we don't usually talk about hydrogen embrittlement unless it's ferritic. So hydrogen embrittlement problem, hydrogen embrittlement problem, hydrogen embrittlement problem. These top and bottom basically are much, much more resistant to hydrogen embrittlement. So, um, uh, then if you have corrosion resistance in aqueous systems, particularly with chlorides, you add molybdenum for pitting resistance. And so you might have 2% molybdenum in a 316 stainless steel. Well, let's say the 304 stainless steel costs you $2,000 a ton with 18% chrome and 8 nickel, rather than $400 a ton for carbon steel. So is, is it now this is just as expensive as, a, as aluminum now, 304 stainless. Well, 316, you can add 2% molybdenum. I don't know what molybdenum is going for now. $30 a, a, a pound? $20 a pound? 40 pounds for 2% in the, in, per ton, okay? And you're now adding $12,000 a ton, okay? To what cost, you know, $2,000 a ton? $14,000 a ton versus $2,000 a ton 
big jump in price to go to 316. But you can also go to 317, which they used to use for a lot of medical applications. It's 4%. So now you're talking $24,000 a ton. And to show you the difference, this is the most dramatic. People use 316 all the time because it's weldable. It's got stress corrosion cracking resistance. But you have to be careful with these because they're all cracked. Okay, you can see the cracks in this thing. It's all rusty. This came out of the ballpark, uh, not ballpark, Fenway Frank hot dog cooker over here in Everett. Okay. So the hot dog cooker is about the size of this room. It's just a big steam oven. Okay. They, you know, chop up all the types of meat you'd never want to eat and make a slurry out of it and extrude it, put it inside the casing. Then they have to, with a lot of salt, Okay, that's why you need chloride resistance. And their original hot dog cooker was all made out of 316 stainless steel. It had been around for 10 or 20 years, no problems. They had to modify some things. It was all specified to be 316. And they put the new stuff in and within several weeks, it was getting rusty, the new stuff was getting rusty. It was cracking. And they called me in and I actually got to see how you cook hot dogs, okay, anyway. There's a lot of interesting things in doing this type of work. Um, and they asked me to figure out why, so we brought it back. Turns out it's 304. Someone used 304 rather than 316. Maybe a, a harmless mistake because, you know, 40, 60% of all austenitic stainless steel is this, and these things are obviously a lot less. It could be any one of these others, but this is a lot less in tonnage, and there's just a mix up, but that 2% molybdenum went from something that would look stainless for 15 or 20 years or more in this environment to something that could only last a couple of weeks. That's the most dramatic example. I've seen plenty of failures where people use 304 rather than 316, but nothing this dramatic, okay? Uh, so uh, the other thing is people will often bring me a piece of steel and they say, it's supposed to be stainless and it can't be because it's rusty. Well, I'm sorry. It, stainless okay there are two types of stainless okay rusty and unrusty okay uh, and actually more specifically <clears throat> if you look at the a galvanic series which i didn't bring with me actually i probably did i probably have it in this book right here um i don't know if i can find it quickly but anyway um the galvanic series is is what dissimilar metals will um, attack one another uh, in a in a series uh, corrosion series, and I'm sure I can't find this that, that quickly. It is in here, but anyway, um, the galvanic series basically has got magnesium as the most electroactive and carbon as the least electroactive, and you got everything in between. Platinum is close to to um, uh, carbon, zinc is close to magnesium, copper is somewhere in the middle, iron is somewhere in the middle. Turns out stainless steel comes in two varieties. There's active and passive. What gives stainless steel its corrosion resistance is a protective oxide. And I will just call it, for our purposes, Cr2O3.NH2O, okay? It's a complex oxide on the surface of the stainless steel that has very good aqueous and high temperature corrosion resistance in most cases, except in the presence of chlorides. Active is one where you take off that protective oxide, and now you're exposing a steel without a protective oxide this one, active, rust, no rust. So there's lots of way to take it off. Yeah. And, and other halides like fluorides also? Uh, fluorides are terrible, worse than chlorides. But there's not a lot of fluorides that we expose things to usually. Okay. Chlorides are everywhere. Fluorides are not everywhere. Is that 
Is that your question? Okay. But yes, fluorides are worse than chlorides. We just don't have them that often. In fact, the best way, the best way to take this chrome oxide off is not hydrochloric off, uh, acid, it's hydrofluoric acid. Okay, that's the most effective. Yeah, you had a question back in the back? Uh, it's 50 nanometers, very thin, okay? Doesn't take much to take it off. Stick it in hydrochloric acid, you take a passive stainless and turn it into an active stainless, okay, within minutes. Yeah. It can be either one, okay? Depends on whether it's got the chrome oxide. 316 with the molybdenum in it is resistant to three times the chloride concentration of 304. 317 is probably resistant to five, five times the chloride concentration. So if uh, typical atmospheric corrosion resistance of 304 might be a thousand parts per million chlorine, okay? In an atmospheric sort of, if you were raining salty water uh, or spraying salty water, 316 would be 3,000 ppm chlorine. 317 might be even higher. The reason you could use it in the body, the, anybody know what the salt content of the body is? The body fluids? 150, what, millimol? Yeah, that's probably is millimolar, but I don't know millimolars <laughs> in PPMs. It, salt, sea water is about 30,000 parts per million and your blood is about 30,000 parts per million. When I was in fourth grade, they taught me that's, that's proof that we evolved from the fishes because our blood content was the same as salt water, if you believe that. Uh, I think it was a little oversimplified, but nonetheless. Basically, inside our body is like seawater in terms of chlorides. There's one important difference. We don't have the same oxygen content that they have at the t surface of the ocean. We might have an oxygen content similar to the bottom of the ocean. I guess that proves that we, we started out not as surface uh, fish, but as, oh yeah, uh, but as deep sea fish. At least, you know, we were deep sea predators, top, top predators or something, you know. Um, in any case, this is better and better chloride resistance. It really depends on not just the chlorine, but the oxygen content, because the chlorine screws up the protective oxide layer when it forms. The nice thing is usually, even in 304, if you break off that protective oxide layer, which is very easy to do, it will reform just in the air as a protective layer, unless there are some chlorides around. So if you want to go over here to the New England Aquarium, how many people have been to the aquarium? Anybody looked, what's the outside made out of? Stainless steel. And what was the specification? The specification was they wanted to make the outside look like fish scales, and they were going to use 304 stainless panels, and they were to be passivated. I read the spec, okay? And passivation means in the mill, they took the coils of steel before they had been stamped into fish scales, okay? Um, and they passed them through a bath of nitric acid, a solution of, nit not concentrated, but about a five or 10% solution of nitric acid. Nitric acid is an oxidizing acid. So you take a stainless steel, you clean it in the nitric basically, but you also oxidize it to form the protective oxide. It's now passivated. You can passivate 304 stainless in 15 minutes in nitric acid. So they bought the passive stainless steel, they cut it into panels the size of these fish scales, they then took a grinder and they brushed on this texture. What happens when you brush on the texture? You're taking off the oxide scale, protective oxide. What happens when you then go put it in a marine environment, Boston Harbor, you get oxidation right along those little scratch marks. And if you go look carefully, very few people do, but I had to. Well, I had to. I got paid for it. Um, <laughs> you will find rust. Okay. In fact, if you go around the side to the loading dock where the trucks come in to, you know, drop off the food and stuff, um, you'll see where they actually scraped up against the stainless steel with their bumpers, and you have big bands of rust. Okay, on the stainless steel, because mechanically abraded away the protective scale 
in a chloride environment, the protective scale did not reform like it would if it was inland, okay? But right there on the coast. And so we had to figure out, one, we had to figure out how to clean it. So I tried um, citric acid that will also, just like nitric acid, we had to have something that was not going to destroy Boston Harbor because all the environmentalists. So one of the things I tried was Diet Coke. Didn't work all that well, but Diet Coke is phosphoric acid, okay? And it also is a cleaning solution. But who could complain about dropping Coke into Boston Harbor, right? Not that kind of Coke, the, the kind you drink, okay? Uh, I had a case like that once. <laughs> it was in New York City in one of these buildings, these 20-story buildings above uh, the approach to the George Washington Bridge, and they had a cr weld crack. And when they let me, when the cab driver let me off, I didn't know the addresses in New York City, dropped me off. There was all these little empty capsules all over the sidewalk, okay, which were basically cocaine capsules, right? Uh, and uh, they told the homeowners, or the condo owners, uh, at a meeting before I was there that they had a crack in the basement. And after the meeting, a bunch of the homeowners wanted to go down there and get some of the crack, okay? <laughs> it's a true story. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I got to see the crack. It's eight feet long. Had a piece of it in my lab here. Anyway, uh, but I didn't eat it. Um, in any case, you have this interaction between oxygen and chlorine in stainless steels. Chlorine's not good for stainless steels. You can add molybdenum at a tremendous cost, but they do all the time. Okay. Then there's the L grade of these things, all three of these, which means extra low carbon. And that means that you can weld it without uh, getting chrome carbides that also destroy the corrosion resistance. And I'll talk about that next time. But let me ta tell you that most of the stainless steel we make nowadays is made by a process that gives us very low carbon, less than three, 30 parts per million chlor, 300 parts per million carbon, um, which prevents these chrome carbides and loss of corrosion resistance for this reason that occurs during welding, and I'll talk about it some more. But um, the process for that, called argon oxygen decarburization, is now the, the process by which every bit of stainless steel, most nickel-based super alloys uh, in the world is made. And it was developed right down here in the basement of Building 8 by a guy named Krefsky, who was doing his doctoral thesis under John Chipman. Um, and they were basically doing basic research. They were bubbling argon through molten, molten steel and looking at the carbon monoxide reaction, carbon and oxygen in the steel, and finding out what would happen. And they found if you bubbled argon rather than air, you would have a low enough oxygen potential in argon, the oxygen potential is very low, you would basically pull carbon and oxygen out. And it used to cost a small fortune to make 304L stainless. Nowadays, with the AOD steel making, where they bubble argon through there, you get low carbon without any difficulty, such that everybody, we hardly ever make 304 stainless, okay, anymore. But back in 1950, it was a super premium to get 304L because it doubled your steel making time. You had to have multiple slags to get the carbon out. Um, but, it, so the process wasn't patented at MIT. Krefsky was doing this basic science research. He went to a company and he realized that, hey, this process could be used commercially to get the carbon out of stainless steel. And since about 1960, virtually every stainless steel in the world is made by argon oxygen decarburization, where you just bubble the argon through and take the oxygen and carbon out of the steel. So, and I once, one time estimated that's worth about a billion dollars a year to the U.S. steel industry, or to the world steel industry. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Well, I thought I was going to finish up steel. Well,